Okay. Okay, well, um, we've seen, if not actually a proof of the not surgery theorem, we've at least seen that there are lots of different ways to prove it. So today what I'd like to do is uh, show you some applications. So, uh, So I'd like to show applications of knot surgery to the problem of understanding surfaces in a four manifold. So So here's here's a, a basic problem. Um, suppose you're given a, a simply connected four manifold and um, some surface uh, sigma, closed surface, well, what one question you might ask is, can you find other surfaces in the same homology class as X that are somehow inequivalent? to sigma, but that, that question is too easy to answer. Anybody can do that. You just take a, take a knot at S2 and S4 and tie a, tie a little knot into the surface, and then you, you mess up the complement, uh, pi 1 of the complement. Really what you're interested in is the relationship, you're, you're interested in the relationship of uh, top to div. So what you want to do is fix the homeomorphism type of a surface inside the four manifold and ask, can you find other surfaces which, so find x sigma prime homeomorphic to x sigma but not diffeomorphic. So, so I'd like to show you a, a simple technique that will produce surfaces like this, but, you know, is hard to detect without some kind of interesting four-manifold invariant, well, cyber witten invariants, for example. So, um, so let's suppose we have a, a surface, so I, I'm going to, let's start with, a, let's say that a surface is uh, primitively embedded so, um, so if, if pi 1 of its complement is 0. So, in particular, duality then implies that this class, you know, its homology class is a primitive class uh, in H2. And uh, okay. And let's suppose also, uh, just for simplicity, let's suppose that sigma has square zero. So it's, you can take it as an exercise to run through this whole construction in the case that sigma has positive self-intersection. Uh, then you can, by blowing up, you can bring its self-intersection back down to zero, and you'll see that you can sort of run through this argument, and it, it will still work after blowing up. Okay, so here's the operation I'd like to perform. So here, here's a picture of sigma. And its uh, normal bundle, or its tubular neighborhood, looks like this cross D2. And uh, I, let's choose some loop gamma. On sigma. And let's look at an annular neighborhood. So here's uh, some annulus. Uh, 
F gamma. And now the operation I'd like to perform is this. So, so this, uh, the restriction of the normal bundle over A of gamma looks like A of gamma cross D2, which we'll think of as S1 cross I cross D2. This S1 is the gamma direction. This I, the I is, can you see green on green? Is this direction. So, um, I want to split this, so this is the, yeah. So, here's a picture of I cross D2, and here's the copy of I, and we have a, a circle, a, the, we have a copy of these parametrized by a circle that can, is part of our surface sigma, and um, what I'd like to do is just tie a knot in this. Let's tie, tie a knot in, in this arc. So, the, the construction is take this arc, tie a knot in it, cross with this circle. What it does is it re-embeds the surface inside the four manifold. So, the picture you get looks like this. Uh, so, now you have a, oh, I don't have to, something like that. So, you tie a knot K. Okay, so this is the new, our new surface now looks just like the old one. It's still inside the same neighborhood, but now a piece of it has gotten knotted across S1. Okay, so, so this new surface, if this knot is K, let's call the new surface sigma sub K. Um, Really, uh, I should somehow include gamma in the notation as well, because that's what we're parametrizing it by, but I won't. Um, okay, so, so we, let's uh, ask, how, how, how does it, okay, so there I tied a knot as a normal person, but so the question is how does a topologist tie a knot? So, um, Here's an arc um, in I cross D2. Uh, how do we tie it into a knot? Well, let's look at a, a meridian to that, to that arc. Uh, this, this meridian in our picture over here is, the, is really the boundary D2. We can view this as boundary D2. It takes a lot of coffee before you can do that, by the way. You can't just do that when you first wake up. So, um, and, and let's uh, think of a, a solid torus neighborhood of that. Okay. So now, if I think of this as, as part of the unknot in S3, then I could, you know, let's take this ball and then there's another ball. And here's the other part of the unknot. Now I have the unknot. And then, then we see, if, the, if we think of the union of these two three balls as S3, then, of course, the complement of V is another solid, we see the complement of V is another solid torus, okay? So we think of V as the exterior of the unknot. And, um, well, Let's replace it by the exterior of some other knot. So, replace by S3 minus the neighborhood of some other knot K. Then what we see is this green gadget is the neighborhood is still a solid torus. Its complement is the complement of a knot. We still have S3. So, what we see is that the green, this green guy has turned into a knot. So, we, this way we can tie 
our ark into a knot without getting our hands dirty. Okay, so... Let's review, try to review this construction in terms of this. So, uh, we start with A of gamma cross D2, which is S1 cross I cross D2. And in here, we take um, a, a solid torus neighborhood of I, or uh, of the meridian to I, so remove uh, V and replace by S3 minus the neighborhood of the knot. And this all got crossed with S1. So you see we're doing knot surgery on some torus. We're doing knot surgery on the torus. S1 cross boundary D2. Well, not quite boundary D2, it's boundary one-half D2 or something, okay? It's the boundary D2 is this. It's this D2 here, a smaller D2, okay? So, um, I like to call that a rim torus because you can think of it as living outside on the rim of the tubular neighborhood. This S1 is the gamma. Okay, so by a rim torus, I mean a torus that comes from a loop on the surface cross boundary of a meridional circle. So they, the rim tori uh, generate the kernel of the map from H1 of X minus uh, the na tubular neighborhood of sigma to H1 of X. Okay. So because uh, this construction is, can be made by not surgery on a rim torus, it's sort of natural to call it rim surgery. And so here's what we can see about rim surgery is first of all, um, the result, the sigma k is clearly homologous to sigma. You clearly haven't changed its homology class. And secondly, you can use topological surgery uh, to show that under this condition of primitively embedded that uh, you get a, a homeomorphism of pairs between, of course, I've, here I've strongly used pi 1 of x. Remember, I assume that x is simply connected. So this is, you know, of course, using work of Mike Friedman, and the actual theorem that you can apply is due to Steve Boyer. Okay. Okay, so the so then the question becomes, how does one show that uh, this manifold that you've obtained by uh, rim surgery, this surface is not diffeomorphic, so there's no diffeomorphism of pairs between x sigma k and x sigma. And, um, well look, you can't just compute the cyber, of course, you know, compute the cyber witten invariant, nothing has changed. You should still have x. We haven't changed the global manifold. So, um, and, so why is that, you might ask? Notice that the, uh, a rim torus is null homologous, yeah? So in the, in the formula, in the formula for computing the Cyber-Witten invariant from 
not surgery, the T you get, the T is one, yeah? And the sum of the coefficients of the Alexander polynomial is one. So you're just multiplying the invariant by one, okay? So, of course, that's not going to change anything. So, um, so what do you do? Well, look, there ought to be, in fact, probably Peter and Zoltan have a good way of doing this. There ought to be a relative invariant that lets you, and this is probably a good project, uh, that lets you pull out the surface, compute a relative cyborg witten invariant, and see that what you get are different, that you're getting different relative cyborg witten invariants. Clearly, that's going to happen. I, I don't know how to do that, but here's what you can do instead when you, when you don't sort of don't have a relative invariant to apply, is um, I'm going to construct a standard pair. Uh, so, so what this standard pair will be is YG will be uh, a Kähler surface. It doesn't have to, it could sort of be any sort of standard gadget. <coughs> and SG, in fact, it'll have a genus G fibration, and SG will be one of its fibers. So this is a surface, this will be a complex curve of genus G. Contained in SG, contained in YG. And it will satisfy nice degeneration properties so that all the, all the, the stuff, the conditions you need about fundamental group of the, or, or H1 of the complement of the torus you're doing not surgery on will be satisfied. <coughs> so let's suppose that we have, so I'll, I'll show you how to construct this in a minute or two. But suppose you have such a gadget, then you can, um, make up for the fact that you don't quite understand how to compute a relative cyborg witten invariant by using this instead. So what, here's the thing to do. See, the problem with trying to detect that this uh, operation actually does something to your surface is that you're performing an operation on something that's null homologous. And so uh, you, it doesn't show up in the group ring. On the other hand, if you take your manifold and uh, fiber sum it along the surface with this other manifold, YG, so, I'm, so now I'm assuming sigma has genus G. If you fiber sum it with YG, then what happens is, Check the Meyer via torus sequence, you'll see that all of a sudden this torus now becomes essential. So now the rim torus let's call it T gamma becomes oh, homologically essential. After all, it's representing an element of uh, the kernel of the, you know, it, do I still have that on there somewhere? Yes. So it's non-trivial in H1 of X minus N sigma, yeah? H1, that should be, sorry about that. I was thinking of the circles, it's H2. <coughs> okay, so, uh, so let's, Form this fiber sum, and, and let's make the following uh, assumption. Let's suppose that, assume that the cyborg witten invariant of when you take this uh, fiber sum, so is it clear what I mean by fiber sum? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so here's what I mean. So each of these have trivial normal bundles. They have self-intersection zero. So what you do is you remove tubular neighborhoods of each, and then glue the boundaries together so that the boundary D2s go to boundary D2s, so that you glue the, you know, the normal disks to the nor boundaries of normal disks to boundaries of normal disks, okay? So you're, you're, you're gluing in the, sort of the most obvious way you can. And let's assume that the cyborg witten invariant of this is non-zero. 
Okay, so when will this be true, for example? Uh, so, so since this ma gadget here is symplectic, and SG, so, you know, you have a holomorphic curve and a Kähler surface, so if, I, if sigma was a symplectic surface and a symplectic manifold X, for example, then the resultant manifold by a theorem of Gomf would again be symplectic. So, since this, is, this would be symplectic, it has, would have a non-trivial Cyber-Gwitten invariant. For example, the canonical class would have to have non-trivial, would have Cyber-Gwitten plus or minus one. So this, so, this hypothesis will be true in case uh, X sigma is a symplectic pair. So, at least hypothesis is often satisfied. Okay, so, so in this case then if you, if you look at the fiber sum of X and YG, but instead of being glued along sigma, identifying sigma with this standard surface SG, you identify sigma sub K. Well, look, so this, how do you, how do you make this? First you do the knot surgery and then you glue the two surfaces together. But, you know, so what, this torus is complete, it's completely, the torus you do knot surgery on is completely disjoint from the surface where you're gluing. So it doesn't matter which order you do the operation. So it, you could just as well first glue the surfaces together, you know, first glue the two manifolds together and then do the knot surgery on the, tor the rim torus that's, you know, what was the rim torus in there? It's because the two, the two gadgets are completely disjoint. So let's use this fact to calculate the cyber gwitten invariant of this. So this tells you that the cyber gwitten invariant of X fiber summed to YG along sigma K is the cyber gwitten invariant of this. So that's the cyber gwitten invariant of the manifold X fiber summed with YG along sigma times the Alexander, the, well, the symmetrized Alexander polynomial of the knot K <coughs> evaluated on T squared, where T represents T equals T sub T gamma. Yeah? So in order for two such gadgets, you know, if you, ha if you had two of these corresponding to different knots K, well, at least knots with different Alexander polynomials, you could never get a diffeomorphism between the pairs, okay? So what, what's happened is we somehow have used this standard gadget to play the role that really ought to be played by a relative cyber gwitten invariant, okay? So this is, a, I should inform my, my, my co-author showing up soon, so I should need to get, so this is due to uh, myself and Ron Stern. Make sure I spell his name correctly. <coughs> okay, so how do you make these standard gadgets? Well, so this really has nothing to do with cyber gwitten theory, or, but let me just quickly tell you. So um, one, there, there are lots of ways to do this, but here's, here's one way. So, Let's take the torus knot T2, 2G plus 1. It's the torus knot. So this, um, so think of, uh, here's B4, S3, and here's, a, here's your torus knot. As seen from far away. So let's attach, attach a, do, attach a two handle to the boundary of the four ball with zero framing along this knot. So, I mean, okay. 
Now, this, this is a fiber knot. And its fiber is genus G. And uh, the key thing is that it has finite monodromy. So its monodromy has order four G plus two. Okay, so what that means is that, you know, the complement of the knot is a fiber, fiber bundle over the circle and uh, the monodromy is an automorphism of this punctured surface <coughs> and if you compose it with itself 4G plus two times, you get the identity, okay? And when you do zero surgery, you close up the surface so you get a, you get a bundle, so the, the boundary of this gadget is a bundle over uh, an actual fiber bundle over the circle with fiber a closed surface of genus G. And in fact, this is going to be true, um, the whole, this whole thing is going to be fibered, except there's going to be a singular fiber <coughs> in the middle. So what you're going to see is this, so here, here's a cone, this is, Artist's rendition of a cone on a T2, 2G plus one torus knot. And um, here's a core of the handle capping it off. So you see a two sphere with a, a very singular point here. Okay? The rest, everything else is fibered. So you see a fibration. What you see is a fibration um, V over the two disc. Its fiber is uh, a surface of genus G, let's call it SG, and uh, it has one singular fiber over the origin. That, that singular fiber is a two-sphere, kills all the, you know, pi, pi one other fibers dies in it. Okay. <clears throat> and so now, because, because this gadget has, because the monodromy has order 4G plus 2, if we glue together, just stick them together end to end, 4G plus two of these things. So, and, and you, you make a fiber sum along the boundary now. You'll see up here, you'll see some manifold W, which is, has a genus G fibration over a disc with now 4G plus two singular points and the monodromy around the boundary, so around the boundary there are no singular points. This is a, a, an honest to God circle bundle and its monodromy is the identity. It's the monodromy of this guy to the 4G plus tooth power. Okay? So you can take its union with um, SG cross D2 because this guy here has trivial bundle around the boundary. And then you, then you have a, a, a fibration over uh, S2 with 4G plus two singular points. And with a nice surface of genus G as its fiber. And so this will be our standard gadget YG. And it turns out that this is actually a Kähler surface if it's done correctly, and this is a holomorphic vibration. And uh, in fact, suppose you look at the case when G is one. When G is one, notice you start with a trefoil knot, T23. That's fibered by tori. You get an elliptic surface, and actually you get the elliptic surface E1. So Y1. which is CP2 blown up nine times. Okay. So now, um, one might ask, what happens if, so I said that one way to make sure that the Cyberg-Witten invariant of this uh, fiber summed gadget is non-trivial so that you can apply the theorem is to ask that the surface should be embedded 
um, is a symplectic, you know, X should be symplectic and sigma should be a symplectic submanifold. Yeah? And um, so you might ask, well, what about this new submanifold? So suppose X sigma is a symplectic pair. Uh, and you form sigma k, can this ever be symplectic? So I want to claim not, so I want to claim it's never. Never provided The Alexander polynomial of the knot is not trivial. So let's see this. Um, let's see. So, well, suppose it. W- I'd love to use the subjunctive. Suppose it were. Then, um, in fact, instead of saying, suppose, it, yeah, okay, let's just say it's symplectic. Really, what I should be saying is this. I'm, the reason I'm stuttering is I stutter when I lie. Uh, really, what I should suppose is that there's, you know, I want to I claim that there's just, it's not even diffeomorphic to a symplectic submanifold. There's no diffeomorphism of pairs that throws it onto a symplectic submanifold, okay? And um, so that's really what I want to claim. But now I'm going to just, I'm just going to forget the diffeomorphism, okay? I mean, that's not a big deal. Because such a diffeomorphism, I mean, a diffeomorphism that throws one submanifold onto another is going to take a rim torus to a rim torus because it takes the boundary of the normal, takes the boundary of the normal bundle to the boundary of the normal bundle, okay? So, uh, so let's just suppose this was symplectic, then we're symplectic. Then um, let's look at its cyber witten let's look at the cyber witten invariant. So um, this so think about X fiber summed with YG again. We're, sig- we're identifying sigma K with SG. So, so if this is symplectic then this gadget here is a uh, symplectic manifold. So this is, once again, this is a theorem of Gong. So we can ask, um, what's, what's its canonical bundle? So if this inherits a symplectic form from uh, the symplectic form on X and the symplectic form on YG. And um, so maybe we should call it omega prime or something. This is a symplectic form. And um, let's notice that uh, when we take omega prime and uh, intersect, so think of it, if you like, think of its Poincare dual, and let's intersect it against uh, the class of the rim torus. T gamma. Well, be, because T gamma lies entirely in X, and it's null homologous in X, and this form, a, a, away from the intersection region, this form agrees with the symplectic form on X. So, so this, let's call it omega X. This is really, can, we can choose our new symplectic structure uh, on this manifold here so that this is true. So this is zero because this gadget here is null homologous. It's homologous to zero. Okay. But now, um, what, what is it, what's the cyborg witten invariant of our new manifold? So the cyborg witten invariant of X fiber summed with uh, YG along sigma K. 
is the cyber witten invariant of X fiber sum with sigma along, along fiber sum with YG along sigma. Remember, this is something non-zero. Um, times the Alexander polynomial evaluated on the class corresponding to T gamma. So what does this look like? So this, you know, the non-trivial entries here, um, each non-trivial entry here uh, gets multiplied by, you know, by uh, all the gadgets here with non-trivial coefficients, yeah? So, for example, there'll be some, some entries 2m t gamma that have non-trivial cyber witten invariants, as long as this Alexander polynomial is not one, and they will add to whatever things here have non-trivial cyber witten invariants. Yeah? In particular, the canonical class has non-trivial Cyberg-Witten invariant. And remember, the canonical class is the, so, so the canonical class has to look like, so K for your new manifold, must have a non-trivial Cyberg-Witten invariant, so it looks like something from here, plus 2M T gamma. For lots of different M's, because this, polynomial isn't just one. There are going to be several different coefficients. There has to be at least one co coefficient other than the constant coefficient where this is non-trivial. So this means there, but, but remember, this guy here intersected against the symplectic form is zero. So all these guys, all these different, so there's more than one thing in this list. And they all intersect exactly the same way against the symplectic form because this has, this intersects zero against the symplectic form. And that contradicts Taub's theorem, which says that the canonical class is the only gadget that intersects maximally against the symplectic form. So that tells you that none of these guys that correspond to non-trivial um, Alexander polynomials could ever be symplectic. So somehow the point is that it's harder now to construct symplectic uh, submanifolds that are sort of distinct than, than it is to this construction. So how does one go about doing that? So let me tell you next how one might construct um, symplectic submanifolds. So this is, this is a harder task, so I'm going to untie my hands a little bit and ask for a little less. So I'm just, I just want to be able to construct them in the same homology class. I think this was true. I think for quite a while it was uh, thought that pro probably, um, well, Certainly, if, if one looks at uh, simply connected complex surfaces and asks um, up to smooth equivalents, say up to smooth isotopy, how many uh, complex curves can there be in a single homology class? The answer is one. And, uh, okay, so, however, so I, I just want to point out that it's a reasonable question to ask that they should be, you know, be in the same homology class. Can you construct different ones? So I'm, for high genus, this is still a very interesting problem. So, um, so I'm going to just talk about genus one and square zero. 
and x simply connected. So I've really loosened the bonds. Okay. So what we have is a torus, some torus, T, contained in a symplectic manifold X, so this is, and T is a symplectic torus of square zero. So now, There's a theorem, um, there's a symplectic tubular neighborhood theorem. That says that we can, that locally we understand the symplectic structure uh, around any symplectic manifold. Yeah. And so we can, you, the symplectic tubular neighborhood theorem tells us that, you know, locally, the symplectic structure locally, omega looks like, so if we write this, our neighborhood as S1 cross S1, so this is our torus T cross D2, then locally omega looks like DX, which DY plus R DR, which D theta, okay? And, uh, Okay, so once again, we're, I'm going to use some kind of dimensionals. You know, this is really a problem about, I, maybe I shouldn't admit this publicly, but maybe you, you can, you're young and have fresh ideas. So one of the real problems with uh, constructions of four manifolds is uh, so many of them, and maybe all of them, are really three-dimensional, not four-dimensional. I mean, not surgery is S1 cross some operation. This thing here was S1 across an operation. It's all dimensional reduction. So perhaps the, the way to really get a hold of four manifolds is to throw, throw away the shackles of three manifold topology <laughs> and <coughs> move up in dimension instead of relying on our lower dimensional brethren. Yeah? So um, maybe we've stood on the backs of the three manifold people for too long. Anyway, so give it a try. So here's what I, so once again, what I'm going to do is think, well, this is S1 cross S1 cross D2. <clears throat> so let's forget about this S1 and work with this S1 cross D2. And so now, so our tubular neighborhood looks like that with sort of a, And uh, here's our torus, runs right through the middle here. So S1 cross this is our torus. So uh, I can construct, um, well, it's, it's not so easy to construct uh, another torus in the same class as T. That's going to be distinct, but it's, it's a lot easier. Suppose I allow myself to, to not try to construct it in the primitive class, but to construct other tori in, in a multiple class. So I'm going to be interested in, just for th this evenness only arises because of the proof I want to use. But I want to look at this class here for M, again, I don't know, maybe greater than or equal to 2, maybe greater than or equal to 1. I can't remember what works. So, um, and so what we'll do, the way we'll construct tori in this class is we'll take a braid. Suppose you take a braid that runs parallel to this circle and closes up to be a knot, okay? So, so what you want is, you know, something that runs around, runs around, runs around. You get the idea, okay? So some braid, B. Well, then it's a simple little calculation that provided this braid keeps moving and, and you know, has non-trivial derivative in the direction of the circle, it's going to be S1 cross, it'll be a symplectic submanifold. And, and so S1 cross B will be symplectic. And 
X, and, and it'll represent the class, you know, 2MT if it's a braid that has 2M strands. Okay, by the number of strands, I mean that's the number of times it pierces one of these normal circles. Okay? And now it's useful, uh, once again, just because for the sake of the construction, let's assume that this braid closes up not just to a knot, but to an unknot. By closes up, I really, it's already closed, I've drawn it closed, but you know, very often you think of a braid as this way, and then you think of closing it up to a knot. So what that means is, um, here's, your braid is running this way, and there's this uh, sort of dual circle. So in my picture here, the the dual circle is any circle parallel to the boundary of a normal disk, um, which you can think of as the axis of the braid. And uh, by close up to an unknot means, you know, it, it's knotted in the solid torus, but when you, once you allow it to pass through the axis, it's unknotted in S3. Okay? And now, so the question is, how does one show that such examples like this should be somehow, you, you can get different examples for different braids. That the, two of them should, so the claim is that, the claim is that you can choose braids such that, uh, you know, for, for any M, you can choose lots of braids. So, you can choose braids B, I, such that, so braids of 2M strands, such that these uh, tori, S1 cross B, I, are, non are all symplectic but non-isotopic to each other. I'm, I'm sorry? I, I want to close up to the on that. I'll show you why in a second. Okay, so, so what, the way I want to try to distinguish them is to take double branched covers. So let's remember what the double branch cover is. It's a, you take, you remove, remove this from from X, I'm going to remove this torus, and then there'll be, I'll be able to take a double cover of the complement, and then you'll be able to stick this torus back in. It's all this, S, you know, S1, T2 cross T2 back into the picture so that um, you get a closed four manifold. So, but for starters, I just want to ask, what's the double branch cover? of uh, S3 branched with branch set equal to the braid. Well, you know, the braid's the unknot, and so it's an, it's an easy exercise to see that the double branch cover of S3 branched over the unknot is S3. So that's S3. And, um, because this, this braid has an even number of strands, uh, every loop in the complement lifts trivially to two, everything, every loop in the complement links it an even number of times, so it lifts, lifts to two copies. Okay? In particular, the axis A lifts to a two-component link. L sub B. B meaning B is the braid. It's contained in S3. 
In fact, this link has a special property. It's a fibered link. Let's see that's true. Um, well, look, A, A is a fibered knot. It's the simplest fibered knot. It's unknotted. Its fiber is D2, and here's a fiber. Yeah, its fiber gets pierced by the braid in two M points. Okay? So A is a fibered knot, its fiber is a disc, and it's pierced in two M points by the branch set. So that means this, its lift in the double cover is a fibered link, and the fiber is the double branch cover of a disc branched over two M points. Okay, so here's an exercise, homework. I haven't given any homework yet. Uh, show that that's a twice punctured surface of genus M minus 1. So this is, I was right, is sigma M minus 1 minus two, two disks, two D2s. Do a week from Monday, Stern will grade them. <laughs> so okay, one minute. Okay, so, um, so let's try to now take the double branch cover of, uh, let's try to take the double branch cover of this torus, S1 cross B, and ask if we can calculate uh, its Seiberg-Witten invariant. Well, let's first ask, can we even, what is it? So double branch cover of X branched over the torus. S1 cross B. Okay, well, I'm going to think X is X minus the neighborhood of our original torus, T. So, this is T cross D2. And inside of here is where we've drawn our new torus that represents 2M times the homology class of T. So, union and T. Now, when you calculate the double cover, every, every loop outside of here links your branch set an even number of times because, remember, we built this with, uh, it's a braid of 2M strands. So, this guy here is double covered uh, trivially. So, when I calculate the double branch cover, it looks like, uh, so let's call this X tilde. That's uh, <coughs> X minus the neighborhood of T, union, whatever the double cover is for the neighborhood of T, union, another copy of X minus and T. So this part, it's trivial. You just have to worry about what the double cover of the neighborhood of T is. <coughs> but, <coughs> so this neighborhood of T, so remember what our, let's see, do I still have a picture? Okay. Okay. So here, here, here was, our neighborhood of T is this. And this red stuff, that's what corresponds to, uh, to B. So that's S1 cross B. <coughs> so, and remember we have this axis A. So here's, there's A. So, we can think NT is really S1 cross S3 minus the neighborhood of A, okay? So NT, S1 cross NT equals S1 cross 
S3 minus the neighborhood of the axis. But now, in, in the double cover, the double cover clearly is just the pro whatever, it's a double cover of this product with S1. And the double cover of this is just the complement of our link LB in S3, right? Because the axis gets lifted to this link, this fibered link, um, LB. So this, so this double cover S of, whoops, I shouldn't write S1 cross NT, just NT, sorry. So NT tilde is S1 cross S3 minus the neighborhood of the link. Okay, so let's see what we got here. Um, so X tilde is X minus the neighborhood of T union S1 cross S3 minus the neighborhood of a link union X minus NT. Well, let's remember, not surgery. Not surgery was remove the neighborhood of a torus of self-intersection zero from a four manifold and stick in the complement of an S1 cross complement of a knot. This is almost the same thing. Here what we've done, think, think of it the other way. Think not surgery is remove the complement of a knot, remove, the, remove a knot from S3, cross with a circle, and then stick in the complement of a torus in a four manifold, right? Here we remove a complement of a link in S3, cross with a circle. Now it's got two components. So we stick in two complements of tori in four manifolds, in this case the same one. It's almost like knot surgery. It's link surgery. <coughs> and just like um, knot surgery, there's a formula for the cyber witten invariant of link surgery. It looks slightly more complicated, but the real reason is because when you write the formula for um, not surgery, instead of using the Alexander polynomial, if you know what Milner torsion is, we should be using Milner torsion, and then the formulas would look exactly the same. But instead, we're using Alexander polynomials, and when B1 is equal to 1, there's a slight difference between the Alexander polynomial and Milner torsion. Okay? In this case, there isn't. So, so the formula is the cyborg witten invariant of X tilde is uh, the cyborg witten invariant of X minus NT times uh, T1 minus T1 inverse times the Alexander, so I'm going to write this sort of in order, times the Alexander polynomial of the link. See, now the Alexander, this is symmetrized, let me emphasize that, T1 T2 squared times uh, T2 minus T2 inverse times the cyborg witten invariant of X minus NT. And now the problem here is the, here we have sort of two different embeddings of X minus NT into the Actually, cyber witten invariant of X. This whole thing is the cyber witten invariant of X minus NT. I'm sorry. Okay. But, but here we're thinking of basically the, the elements of the group ring are coming from the second embedding, and here we're thinking they're coming from the first one. Okay. This is kind of a problem because um, when you have a two-variable polynomial, it's not so easy to tell that two two variable pol polynomials are representing different cyber witten invariants because they depend on a choice of basis, right? And so, um, but, but, but you know, what you can do is, since we're trying to show that, um, see, it, if that weren't true, then, the, then the, the result would be easy. Then you just say, well, look, uh, we just choose links that have different Alexander polynomials and glue up to give you the unknot, you know, and um, that, that come from links that glue up to give you the unknot, and you'll get different embedded tori. 
Um, but that's not true. So what you have to do is use a reduced Alexander polynomial. What you do is sort of, you have your, the, you're trying to calculate cyber Witten invariance up in the double cover, and you push the whole pro since since you're only trying to do this up to isotopy in, in the base, uh, you can push the, in, push the elements of the group ring down to the base. The point being the diffeomorphism that's supposed to throw one on the other induces the identity and homology down here because it's coming from an isotopy. So these two things will push down to be equal down here. And so what you should be really be looking at is you should be setting T1 equal to T2. That pushes everything down into the group ring of the homology of the base. And there you're computing what's known as the Hasakawa polynomial. The Hasakawa polynomial is the Alexander polynomial, well, you're redu computing the reduced Alexander polynomial, which is the Alexander polynomial of TT, okay? And then the Hasakawa polynomial somehow, it's that, that divided by T minus one or something like that, right? Okay, <laughs> and the reason having a fibered link helps is because um, the reduced Alexander polynomial can be calculated from the characteristic polynomial of the monodromy of the fibration. And how can you ever see what that is? Well, because you have a braid, uh, the moves that tell you what braid you've got lift in the double cover to give you um, to give you uh, surgeries. They, they, what are those things called? Um, full tw Dane twists. They give you Dane twists as elements of the monodromy. And so you can calculate the monodromy from the braid moves. And you surely don't want to see me do that, but it's in, it's in whatever paper this appears in. So I think I'll end here and just say that there, I, th I hope there are a lot more examples of not surgery, but even more, I hope that you're stimulated to come up with truly four-dimensional examples of constructions, things that don't rely on dimension reduction, because then I think you'll find truly new phenomena in four manifolds. Thanks a lot.